Uh, our next speaker is Akram Tuyu from University of Maryland. And uh, take it away. Oh, thanks. Yeah, hi everyone. So I'd like to begin by first thanking the organizers for putting together this really great workshop. I enjoyed the talk so far and I'm looking forward to the rest of the talks and also the rest of our discussions. So the title of my contribution today is eavesdropping on the decohering environment, quantum Darwinism, amplification, and the origin of objective uh, classical reality. And this is a work done in collaboration with Ben Yan, uh, David Garlami, Sebastian Defner, and Wojciech Zurich. And if anyone is interested in technical details, uh, so this is the archive number of the paper that this talk is mainly based on. So similar to the previous talks that we had during this morning session, the main theme of the talk is quantum Darwinism. So this really calls for a quote from Charles Darwin himself. And this is actually taken from the last paragraph of his book, The Origin of Species. And it reads as follows. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful, most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So science aside, this is a, truly one of the most uh, beautiful passages in the English language, I hope you'll agree. So uh, in the previous talks that we saw about quantum Darwinism, there was this uh, close analogy between natural selection and what's happening uh, in quantum Darwinism, how quantum Darwinism describes quantum to classical transitions. And I wanna seize this opportunity to kind of state up front or emphasize this, this the connection by talking or mentioning the main goal of my talk, which is uh, describing a specific type of evolution and that is how quantum states evolve to classically objective states. And I'll define or mainly recall the definitions that were already mentioned about what we mean by classically objective states. And just to go back from the quote, so the so simple beginning in our case is just unitary evolution. So we have the state of the system plus the, the environment that is described by a given wave function that evolves unitarily according to the Schrodinger equation. And from there, we can start talking about some notions of classical objectivity or classical robust states. So the title or like the, the outline, the main outline of the talk is uh, I'll first begin by a general overview. Again, this is just recalling what was already mentioned in previous talks, namely notions such as pointer states and what we mean by objective reality and also the redundancy of information. And I'll focus on this point as this is really the, the core idea of quantum Darwinism, even though I'll be talking about some general information theory quantities or like a, a robust mathematical way uh, information theoretic way one can characterize quantum to classical transitions, one should keep in mind that the main and core insight of quantum Darwinism is this rise of redundancy. And the information theoretic uh, quantities or measure are just a, a mathematical construct that can point the way to the actual, uh, to an actual deep understanding of what happens to the redundancy of information in the environment. And then I'll talk, or the second part of the talk will be on, on the specific model that we use in our paper, which is a mini qubit model. And this really describes a family, a family of models where you have a central qubit interacting with a mini qubit environment. And here I'll be specifically talking about a setup and assumptions that we that we use and what we mean specifically by the emergence of classicality in these in these class of models. And at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll finish with some take home messages, uh, basically summarizing the main ideas of the talk and hopefully the things that you'll remember at least one week after my presentation. So. In order to talk about the big picture of quantum Darwinism, the first step that was already mentioned is the coherence theory. So it's a first, but it's not sufficient step to describe or characterize the emergence of classicality. So decoherence is generally defined as the spaces dependent process of loss of quantum coherences. So it is the destruction of your off diagonal terms in a given basis. If you look at the reduced density matrix of the system of interest and the general context or the, the, the general notation that we'll be adopting throughout the talk that is also used in the coherence theory is a quantum system S interacting with the environment E. And again, here we're assuming that the state of system and environment is given or described by a wave function, hence the state here is pure. The mathematical construction, I would say, of the coherence theory is based on tracing out the degrees of freedom in the environment. So by tracing out these degrees of freedom, one focuses only on the reduced dynamics of the system of interest, which can be modeled through your master equation of choice, where first term is just the unitary, the von Neumann term. Second term is some general super operator that models or depends on how you model system environment interactions or how you model the environment itself. But the 
the math aside, the conceptual picture, physical picture here of the coherence that one should keep in mind is that the environment has really this passive role of being a sink for information. Since we're tracing out the degrees of freedom in the environment, we're neglecting the information that the environment carries about this, the system from their interaction. And this is not what happens in our daily observations because most of this, so the information that we're getting about the world around us is from eavesdropping on the environment. So this is not what's, what's really happening as we carry out our daily, effectively classical observations. And basically this is where quantum Darwinism comes in. So quantum Darwinism recognizes that the environment is not this passive actor. It's not this, this uh, sink for information, but rather it is a witness to the information contained in the system of interest. And it is really, uh, one can see it mathematically as a, as a communication channel through which we learn about the system or systems of interest around us. And the perfect, or I guess ubiquitous example in the literature for that is the photon environment, which was discussed in previous talks. And the, the simple example is that right now you're able to see my slide, not by some sort of direct interaction with your monitors, but you're actually capturing photons emitted from your screens. And you're actually capturing a small fractions of those photons. And this is the, the big idea of quantum Darwinism is that this sense of emergence of classicality comes from the fact that we as outside observers do not have access to the whole environment, but rather we're accessing fra fragments or parts of the environment. And by eavesdropping on these fragments of the environment, that's how we get this sense of emergence of classicality. And I'll, I'll elaborate on this point in, in, in a few slides. And here, the general notation I'll be adopting is that this is a fragment or what we know as a fragment of the environment with M degrees of freedom. And before we go into the, uh, I would say more deeply into the, the big picture of quantum Darwinism, I wanna, I wanna take a step back and, and formulate in, in words, the objective that we have within this framework or the objective related to the results I'll be presenting today is to quantify exactly the information that can be obtained from environmental fragments. And here we're using tools that were initially developed in classical information theory and then extrapolated or, or used the, in, in quantum information theory. And the main three quantities of interest that I'll focus on are the quantum mutual information, discord, and the Holivo information or the Holivo bound. So the quantum mutual information uh, is just quantifying the total bipartite correlations between system and the fragment. So this includes both quantum and classical parts, which itself can be decomposed into quantum and classical contributions. So the quantum mutual information is just simply the sum of this code plus this whole level information. And here, uh, the notation that I'm using, so this check mark means that I'm measuring the fragment here to learn about the system. So this is the kind of the indirect feature of measurement or how we acquire information about the system uh, uh, in the quantum Dar uh, Darwinism formalism here. And this is in direct contrast with what was, what was already uh, extensively studied in the literature where one computes the same quantities, but it was much easier to compute uh, uh, measurements on the system rather than arbitrary fragments of the environment. So these three or these first three will be the main, the main uh, uh, the main quantities of the talk about one thing to emphasize, which is really important, is I'll, I'll show in the mini qubit model all the quantities, not only measurements on F, but also measurements on S. And the idea is that uh, even though conceptually and physically one would, would want quantities where you're measuring fragments of the environment, any reasonable or sensible information theoretic measure should point the way to the, to the actual or to the correct physical picture. So they should all agree or they should all give us the same physical picture. And in this case, all the roads should lead to Rome. And in this case, all the roads lead to redundancy. So no matter how we pick our information theory measures, so whether we measure the fragment, or whether we measure the system, we should get the same, the same physical picture. And that is the underlying feature of quantum Darwinism, which is redundancy. So to explain mathematically just a little bit in detail the notation and also the, the, the quantities that we're discussing. So I'll start with the Holivo information. So for general, two general quantum systems, and here we're considering system and a fragment, the quantum mutual information is just a sum of von Neumann entropies so of the, the, the system and the fragment separately minus the von Neumann entropy of the composite state. And the Holivo information, so the interesting thing is that in classical information theory, there is another equivalent definition of the mutual information, which also, which relies on a conditional entropy. Uh, but in quantum information theory, the definition becomes tricky because one needs to specify the family of measurements that we're applying on the subsystem that we're measuring. And in this case, if we're measuring F, the whole level quantity is just H of S minus the conditional entropy of S that is conditioned on the outcome of measurements that we're applying on F. And 
one, one idea that I wanna also uh, make clear is that uh, one can see this as a simple physical process. So initially you have some uncertainty associated with the state of S. And at the end of this process, you make your measurements on the fragments and you learn something about the system indirectly from the fragments. Then at the end of the process, you have this new uncertainty that is conditioned on the outcome of the measurements that you get. So the difference between the two quantities is simply the uncertainty lost during this process of measuring the fragments, which is really the information gained about the system from measuring the fragments. And as I alluded to, so that this, this Holivo quantity is different from the quantum mutual information. So this captures the classical correlations, this captures both classical and quantum, and actually uh, this is basically how this code is defined. So this code is simply the difference between the two quantities, and as the name suggests, it is just the discord between two definitions of mutual information that become equal to each other uh, in, in classical information theory. And the small caveat here is that we're optimizing over a family of measurement, which makes it uh, harder to, to compute, at least uh, analytically in some cases. Uh, and this is the notation that I, that I adopted earlier. So the check mark means that I'm making a measurements on F and I'm optimizing these measurements such that we're picking the family of measurements that gives us the maximum Olivo information or the maximum information about the system of interest, which places an upper bound to what we actually learn about the system from fragments of the environment. So these are our, our main quantities of interest. And again, just to, to recap the definition, the quantum mutual information is both quantum and classical parts of the correlations. The Olivo bound is the classical part of those correlations and quantum discord is purely the quantum part that can go beyond the entanglement. So even for separable state, one can have non-zero discord. So th this is more or less the kind of mathematical picture, but just to go back on, on the, the, the big picture of quantum Darwinism, I think about it generally in terms or as a two-step process. So the first uh, step is uh, decoherence. So when you have a quantum system that is inevitably acted upon by its environment, there are a few states that survive this process and these are called pointer states. And the whole process is uh, referred to as ein selection, which is short for environment induced super selection. So really these pointer states are determined by the interaction between system and environment. And the next, which is the important step here, is how we move from this notion of pointer states to a notion of objective classical robust states or what I'll be referring to as objective reality. And to put it in words, so objective reality is when you have different observers accessing different parts of the environment and they come together and they reach consensus on their independent measurements. And this is really drawn from our classical intuition about classical systems. And the name quantum Darwinism basically comes from this fact. So pointer states are the states fit to survive their environments and they are able to produce information theoretic offspring in the environments. And that's how we reach this, this notion of objective reality because we have different copies of classical information about S that is proliferated in different parts of the, uh, of the environment. So again, I wanna emphasize for a third time the, the fact that redundancy is really the core idea, even though we're, we're characterizing things in terms of information theory quantities to characterize quantum to classical transitions, really the hallmark of classicality is this rise of redundancy uh, in, in the environment. So after defining the big picture, now we move to a specific setup. So that's the setup that we chose in our paper where we can actually determine the analytic expression of all the information theory quantities that I mentioned. And the, the setup is very simple. So it's a, it's a central qubit interacting with a mini qubit environment. So the central qubit begins in an initial superposition of zero and one. So these are the, the pointer states in this case that we can parameterize through these parameters P and Q. And uh, here I'm assuming the, the qubits do not interact with each other. And this is kind of a, analogous to the more realistic uh, scenario of photon scattering model where at least to the energy scales that we are interested in, photons do not interact with each other. And here I'll, I'll pick the case where the environment begins in a pure state, uh, namely in the all up state, but the, the complication of beginning with a mixed environment is really not necessary, at least for this point of our analysis. And it was already studied in these two papers that, I, that, I'm, that I'm having here, where uh, essentially the result is that having a mixed environment or having an environment that is not pure directly hinders the amount of redundancy, but as long as uh, you don't have a totally mixed environment, which is a useless communication channel, you can actually uh, reach consensus between observers. So here we'll focus in on pure environments and the interaction between each qubit of the environment and the central qubit is mediated through what we call an imperfect CNA operation. And if we focus, and to explain this, this operation, so if we focus only on a single qubit from the environment and the central qubit, so 
if the central qubit begins in the zero state, so the state of the environment remains at state zero, so we're not affecting the state. And if the state of the qubit begins in the one state, then instead of rotating the state of the qubit all the way to one, which, which is what you do in a CNA operation, we rotate into a superposition of zero and one that we can also here parameterize through S and C. And this parameterization is nice in the sense that it allows us freedom to tune the degree with which the environment qubits are monitoring or essentially learning or measuring the central qubit. And the idea again uh, is that we can actually derive exact analytic expressions of all the information theory quantities that I mentioned. And the goal is to quantify what we mean by information that is obtained from environmental fragments. And the main, uh, there are two main tricks. One can actually derive analytic expressions. So the first one is the structure of the branching state for these family of models that I discussed, where after the interaction between system and environment, we get this following uh, branching state is specifically of two branches corresponding to the pointer states zero and one here. And just to clarify the notation, so the one here is not orthogonal to zero. So we don't have a pure, uh, we don't have a, a perfect CNA in the sense that uh, the one that I'm describing is just a superposition of zero and one. So they're not orthogonal to each other. Uh, one can show from, from this structure of branching state uh, that if you pick a given partition, so let's say if you look at the density matrix of S, density matrix of F, or the joint density matrix of S and F, they're all described by rank two density matrices. So effectively, they're a virtual qubit, which you can write down in a given basis as a two by two matrix. And from this, this uh, quite straightforward decomposition, one can get analytic expressions of the von Neumann entropies of S, F, and also S, F, of M. And from these, von Neumann entropies and through the definition of the quantum mutual information, we get directly the, the expression of the mutual information. And here, so uh, when I talked about a general class of uh, like uh, beyond the imperfect CNOT model, actually what we're describing on the information theory expressions that we're describing are uh, invariant with respect to local unitaries in the sense that I'm describing things physically in terms of imperfect CNA operations, but the results I'll be showing you are, are general if you apply local unitaries and rotating your state of the system or rotating the state of the environment locally, because then the correlations do not change. And what I'm describing is remains the same. And the second trick, which is really a fascinating relationship from quantum information theory is the Kawashi winter relation. And this allows us to compute the Holivo quantity for optimal measurements on arbitrary fragments. So as uh, you can take as many qubits as you want. And this kawashi winter relationship tells us that the, this Holivo quantity is just the von Neumann entropy in S minus the amount of entanglement, which is the entanglement of formation between S and Fn minus M. So that's the part of the environment that we're not measuring. And I think this really deserves a slide on its own. So just to elaborate a little bit. So the, generally, the quashi winter relationship is valid for a general three-partite system, but here I'll focus on two qubits because, as I mentioned, so taking any partition, you'll be only looking at virtual qubits in our case. So let's say you have a, a, a mixed state, row AB, then you can purify the state such that row ABC is pure, and the quashi winter relation is the following expression for, these, for this three-partite system. And in our case, it just simplifies to this, where you're measuring the fragment of the environment with m qubits, and also this fn minus m is again the, the part that we're not, uh, we do not have access to, we do not measure. What's what's interesting about the quantity uh, conceptually is that let's say you have uh, you have a given uncertainty about the state of your system, then the larger the amount of entanglement that S shares with the part of the environment that you're not touching, the less information that is accessible to you through measurements on F, and this is the upper bound. Uh, so this is like a, through optimal measurements. And th these kind of trade-off relations are really interesting and give uh, a general flavor of uh, this, this kind of fundamental trade-off between quantum and classical spread of information in quantum many body systems. And there is a paper actually coming up soon uh, that is led by Davide, where we, we are exploring uh, generalizing the kawashi winter relation by set of uh, having a trade-off between Holivo and the entanglement of formation, we're describing a trade-off between Holivo and discord, so going beyond, beyond entanglements. And it, it turns out that it's a much more complicated relationship, but one can still draw some interesting conclusions from that. So now that we describe ba basically all the tricks necessary to actually get the analytic expression, so these are the analytic expressions. I'm not going to go into the mathematical details, but the idea is that you can express everything in terms of the initial superposition that you can prepare your state of system in, so the Q and P here, and the S that describes the degree with which each qubit of the environment is monitoring uh, 
the central qubit. And here I'm also expressing the Holivo information, both on S, so measurements, optimal measurements on S and optimal measurements on F. From which, so if we, if we have the mutual information, we can get this code from these, from these quantities as well. But just to get a flavor of, of the behavior, I just want to illustrate this in a couple of plots. So let's say we have uh, an environment composed of 50 qubits, so a total of 50 qubits, and a C that is roughly 0 0.5. So not very bad and not, uh, uh, it's very far from being a perfect C naught operation. So the interaction between the environment and system is not a C naught operation. The first plot to look into is the quantum mutual information that was mentioned in previous talks. And we actually get the classical or the, the, the famous classical plateau where increasing the number of qubits that we have access to, we directly go to a plateau where increasing the number of qubits does not change much the value of the mutual information. And roughly speaking, that's when we can say that the, the observers agree on their measurements or they reach the, the, the uh, consensus. And to contrast this behavior of the mutual information with that of the Holivo, and for now we'll focus on measuring the system, uh, similar behavior, except that when you capture almost all the fragments of the environment, the Holivo stays at a plateau. It just captures only the classical part of the correlations, while the mutual information jumps to two. Well, exactly here, it's two times the von Neumann entropy of S, which is equal to one in this case. And th this is a direct consequence of the fact that we have a pure state of system plus the whole environment. And also by looking at this code, so this code can be given directly by the, taking the quantum mutual information and uh, subtracting from it the, the, this whole Holivo information. And this we get, uh, and from this we get that this code is equal to zero and also starts rising when we start capturing almost all the fragments in the environment. And then the physical picture that is nice here to, to think about is that we're assuming unitary evolution between system and the whole environment. So quantum information is conserved but it is conserved globally. But if you look at it locally, you cannot access the quantum information by measurements on S. You can only look at it globally, which, which is expected. And one thing to look at here, so if we zoom in only in this early rising behavior of the Holivo information, if we compare it with the Holivo when you measure uh, the fragments for optimal measurements, we see actually very similar behavior as expected. And the, the interesting, or a couple of interesting things about both plots is that they're quite insensitive to changes of the initial uh, superposition that we pick for the system, that is the value of P. And also, uh, I will talk about this uh, later on, they're insensitive to changing the total number, this initial rise at least, insensitive to changing the total number of degrees of freedom that you have in the environment. And one can do, uh, upon appropriate rescaling, it's insensitive with changes to values of C and S. So how, how good the environment is actually monitoring the, the central system. And this gives us a, a, a really nice result of a universal uh, rising behavior that is, that is quite insensitive to how we, we tune uh, the parameters of our problem. And the other final thing to look at is, is what happens when we measure fragments of the environment, which I alluded to earlier. And th so the interesting consequence from the fact that the, the Holivo information when measuring fragments is a lower bound to the actual quantum mutual information which is uh, basically a statement on the distinguishability of the states of the fragments of the environment. So initially for small fragments, they're not orthogonal to each other and they become orthogonal once you start capturing enough fragments of the environment. That's where the Holivo starts agreeing directly with the quantum mutual information. And this gives us actually this code that is non-zero for small fragments. And this is directly the consequence of, of the distinguishability I just mentioned. And the last thing I wanna, I want to kind of focus on is this universal rise rising behavior, which actually extends to photon uh, photon scattering model. So the expression of the quantum mutual information that that I showed you here is exactly equal to that uh, that was derived in uh, a couple of papers by Jess Riddle and Wojciech uh, for a realistic photon scattering model, which shows that the results that I'm that I'm describing here directly follow for that model, at least for the quantum mutual information and the Holivo bound is still. Uh, it's, it's still not determined when you measure uh, fragments or fractions of photons. It's still an open problem. So this universal rising behavior in our model, so if you, let's say again, here I'm illustrating only for 30 spins and for different values of P. So the idea is that you only get the shift of the plateau. And if you rescale the, the quantum mutual information, i.e. dividing, so here I'm, I mean by rescaling the y-axis, which is dividing the mutual information by the actual value of the plateau, there is not much difference between, between the quantities for different values of P. And one can quantify this simply through this delta I. And if you actually plot this and look at it for almost all values of P prime that we have, 
they're, they coincide with each other. And only we see differences when P prime is closer to one and closer to zero. And that's the case where the system already begins in a, in a pointer state. And there's no, no interactions there. And the other, the other point uh, that I mentioned briefly in the previous slide is this independence on changing the total number of degrees of freedom in the environment is that one can prove that for, uh, for small, very small fractions of the environment, the quantum mutual information is approximated by, by the von Neumann entropy of fragments of the environment, which depends directly and only on the fragments that we have access to, in this case, the qubits that we have access to. So changing the total number of degrees of freedom in the environment really doesn't change this initial rising behavior uh, of the mutual information. And again, this, this, directly, uh, this directly follows in, in the photon scattering model, which is a more realistic setup. And actually shows that our our C or like imperfect C naught model captures these features that were already captured in photon scattering. And with that, I'd like to finish with five main take-home messages. So you can forget all the technical details and remember these five points. So the first point is that the quantum mutual information and discord are useful information theory quantities to track quantum to classical transitions. But one should keep in mind that the main insight of quantum Darwinism or the, the really the, the, the hallmark of classicality is the rise of redundancy. So these quantities point the way to the, to the actual uh, rise of redundancy, but one can define, uh, or rather one can talk about emergence of classicality uh, rigorously only in terms of redundancy. And the second point, which is really the main idea of quantum Darwinism is that the environment is no longer the sink for information that was described in decoherence theory, but rather it should be treated in equal, uh, with the system in equal footing. And it is actually a communication channel through which we learn about the world around us. And the main quantities that I focused on during the talk are quantum discord and the whole evil bound that give us really a clear picture of both the, the quantum and classical correlations that we get from between S and the fragments or arbitrary fragments of the environment. And the third point, which is really the, the the idea that I was that I was focused on during the talk is that all roads lead to quantum Darwinism in the sense that picking uh, different but sensible information theoretic measures should all point the way to the correct uh, correct behavior uh, of information in the sense that it should all tell you that there is a rise of redundancy, which is the hallmark of classicality if the system is indeed transitioning from being quantum to classical. And the the four point, uh, which is the, the the main quantity that I that I uh, that I think is core in, in, in this analysis of quantum to classical transitions is the Holivo bound when you measure fragments of the environment. This really places a clear upper bound on what we learn from fragments of the environment uh, in, in realistic scenarios. Because in realistic scenarios, this is really an upper bound and one cannot reach it unless uh, you access uh, the fragments globally. And even though I was focused or I didn't show uh, it didn't show actually, I only showed the results relating to, to op optimal measurements on fragments. One can also show that we reach consensus for things like random local measurements numerically, and also for just basically local measurements in a given basis for fragments of the environment. And the final point is this rather surprising behavior of this universal rise of the mutual information, which extends to photon scattering, and also the whole evil information even says that these quantities or their initial rise is quite independent or insensitive to changes in the parameters of our problem upon appropriate rescaling, rescaling of the, the main quantities. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, Ben Yan, uh, David Gerlami, Sebastian Defner, and Wojciech Zurich, and this is where the money comes from. So this was part of a project uh, during my summer internship at Los Alamos. And if anyone's interested, here's the archive number of the paper, and there is a paper coming up soon, so stay tuned for that. And also a little bit of a classical spam here. So there is a special issue in quantum Darwinism in honor of Wojciech's 70th birthday. So if you have any interesting papers, feel free to submit them there. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Akram, for your talk. Okay, we have quite a lot of time left for questions. Does anyone have questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So in the in the circuit model, which you showed, um, you have uh, these kind of semi-C not gates 
which mediate the interaction with the environment. <clears throat> which seems like a somewhat specific kind of interaction. I was wondering how much uh, the results hold if you generalize the interaction to something else. Yeah, so, so so the idea is so the, the result should hold for for other types of interactions, but but the, 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 in the sense that as I mentioned earlier, so here I was explaining it in terms of imperfect CNOT, where the environment, which is more, which is actually general, which is the environment fragments are not orthogonal to each other in the branching state. So if you look at the branching state, we do not have this this orthogonality between the zero and one e here that I'm describing, and. Uh, what regarding your question about other interactions yeah they we can actually get that by applying local unitary so basically the 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 correlations are invariant with respect to local unitary so what i described remains valid if you apply a local unitary and just let's say rotate the state of the environment and then it will give you some sort of symmetric operation where both the zero and the one are changing the state of the fragments which is a more general kind of way of looking at it but not necessarily for for the controlled like imperfect CNOT, but it stays valid for that. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, maybe I can ask one 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 extra follow up question then. So. In Maro's talk, we, we got a story um, about how Darwinism is not quite as universal as we might have thought, but, um, but, but in, in your presentation, um, we get a, a picture that, that all roads lead to, lead to Darwinism. This is kind of what motivated my question about the specificity of the interaction, because in, in Mara's picture, it's, it seemed to be quite specific to the system. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. So, so my yeah. statement about all roads lead to Darwinism in the sense that if you actually get this, this emergence of classicality, then any information theoretic measure that you're, that you're describing will lead to the correct picture about redundancy. But I agree with the fact that actually, so if, and, and this is something that we know early on. So if you pick random states from the Hilbert space, they're, of course, they're not objective. And, and uh, the previous talk also talks about the, the idea of non-Markovian behavior, which is also, I think, I, I agree with the picture that they should not be compatible in the sense that you get always this backflow of information from the environment to the system. So there is no way, at least to my understanding, that one can reach objective states in, in that sense. So again, so the, the all roads lead to quantum Darwin is that it's more of a, a more of an idea of uh, not generalizing saying that all or typical states are actually objective, but rather from, from an information theoretic perspective, if your state is actually objective, any information theoretic measure you pick will lead to the correct way. So it doesn't matter. It's like, it's like all measures lead to Darwinism rather than all dynamics. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Exactly. Yeah, 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 that's much correct. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Michael. That's all right. I wanted to make a comment on the comment. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, quantum Darwinism, isn't universal as I mean it's not very universal right it's very particular right so when you say that you know it's not as universal as we would have thought I think that's I mean it depends on who who the person is right so sorry I just got <laughs> I walked up to my office um so so you know most models will not give rise to objective states right and, and that includes most physical models right yeah. down any model of you know interacting electrons whatever they're not going to give rise to objectivity. It's a very specific consequence of photons and <laughs> that don't interact with each other after interacting with the system and, and things like that, right? That's all. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that picture. And also just to add one thing on the kind of this, this idea of typicality, one, one can actually, well, ideally the hope at least to, to reach a notion of typicality if you impose additional conditions, additional constraints on your Hamiltonians or additional constraints on the environment. So let's say the, uh, there is good decoherence between system and environment. And if your environment is a good communication channel, then you should expect that typical states within these specific Hilbert spaces should lead to classicality. But outside that, like, like, uh, like Mike just mentioned, it, it's, it's not definitely typical. Um. Okay, Yarek, you want to speak next? Well, I wanted to ask, has anyone of you guys studied uh, for which Hamiltonian it is typical? Uh, 
no so that's something i'm currently thinking about but it's it's not it's okay. not there yet yeah okay and we i did think some studies I, mean, I will i will present it in a second then then next. it seems that we are the only ones we we did some studies on oh okay that'll be yeah that'll be and, interesting and, so yara can i jump in i mean we, we have sure, a sure, sure, Michael. Uh, mm -hmm. you know look at our 2014 prl mm -hmm. uh, i showed the result in my talk today the redundancy is equal to the turn off information essentially and, and that proof applies to a huge class of models okay so we have a general result there it includes models with a self hamiltonian of the environment it includes all kinds of models so so keep that in mind okay okay thanks okay well i guess it's like the last call for questions but if not we'll go to the next speaker